Okay, we are all set to go. So we are talking about law and morality and how morality and values of a certain society help shape the decisions that lawmakers make and those decisions being which laws to make, which laws that need to be changed, and also consequences that people face if laws are broken. So let's look at the learning goals for this law and morality lesson. So laws generally reflect the values, attitudes, and beliefs of the majority of Canadians, but there will always be a tension there. So tension being the struggle between what the community believes is right and what, the and what other members of the community believe are wrong. So laws that possibly need to change. What is the relationship between law and morality in Canadian society? Many of our laws are based on religion and morality, which we will see. The next part of the lesson is going to look at the historical roots of law. We accept that we should not steal or kill, but we also agree that acts considered immoral. Well, actually, this is a bit older of one here because prostitution in itself is not, in fact, illegal. So the seeking out of a prostitute is the illegal part of it. So the moral values of our society that people should be treated equally and with compassion are supposed to be reflected in our laws. And we looked at that with Jordan's principle. So let's take a, a step back to Jordan's principle for a second. I'm going to change the tab that I'm sharing. So at the heart of Jordan's principle, is something called substantive equality. Substantive equality. If you have the chance right now and you have something around that you can write this down on, please write down the term substantive equality. So substantive equality is one of the key outcomes when it comes to indigenous relations in that instead of a government just talking about something happening, it is in fact a government looking at outcomes and results. Outcomes and results are what are used to measure equality in society. The other very important piece in substantive equality is that the end goal is overcoming barriers that have led to inequality in the first place. So at the heart of it, tackling issues like anti-black racism. So if we were to discuss the issue of carding, which was done away with in Toronto. The issue of carding was stopping people based on their race in certain neighborhoods in Toronto and just get, taking down their information even if they hadn't done anything wrong. So that's the issue of carding. And we'll talk more about that when we look at the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Unit 2. So substantive equality, please be sure to write that down, to write that term down before you carry on. You could even put it on the Jamboard, substantive equality. Okay, back to it. Okay, so lawmakers can apply standards that go beyond what the community values or wants. For instance, the Canadian government abolished capital punishment in 1976, despite the public still being divided on the issue of whether the death penalty, so capital punishment is also known as the death penalty, should go away. Let's look at this from a law and justice standpoint. Specifically, let's refer back to the rule of law, the principle number one. So the concept of justice is open to debate what is just or unjust, but we all share common agreement on the characteristics of justice or whether, whether a law is broken or whether that law should exist in the first place. And the fact that it is there for peace, safety, and order, a certain law. So peace, safety, and order. Okay, characteristics of justice. 
we looked at common law. So the one characteristic ju of justice in this case is the characteristic of common law, where judges treat like cases alike and use precedent. And you see here that I've added stare decisis as judicial decisions. Discrimination should be irrelevant in the characteristics of if something is unjust. So what a person looks like, who a person is, what their background is, that should not be a characteristic. For example, it would be reasonable to deny a person entrance to a university program because of poor marks, but it would be unjust to deny admission based on gender or race. So let's take a look at those two terms. We have reasonable, and then we have the term unjust. So for an injustice to take place, it would be something along the lines of denying a person admission based on their gender or race, not just their marks. Laws should be applied impartially. So a police officer who stops a person for drinking and driving should treat that person the same as anyone else. If a police officer pulls a person over for speeding, that police officer should treat a person of color the exact same way as they treat a person who is white. And finally, the law itself must reflect a balancing of conflicting rights that is consistent with society's values. So in our society is considered unjust to buy or sell a child. And according to what you folks talked about in the survey, it is unjust to deny a child certain services, certain social services because of their racial background. In this case, the fact that they are indigenous or an indigenous child. Okay, finally, your criteria for judgment, which you are going to use in the survey today are, one, are the considerations for individual rights explicit or implied? That means, is it listed the individual, the individual right, or is it something you have to look for and make your own conclusions about in the case summary relevant to deciding the outcome? Are the considerations relevant and appropriately applied? That means the unjust versus the just. So, and finally, are they fair? Are they fair? Does it reflect the, the, the balancing of rights or other considerations? Alrighty, so you don't need to 100% understand those criteria for judgment you'll see that these are reflected in the questions that are listed on the classroom page. So that's it for this lesson. I am going to press stop on my recording.